Hey, Brian, how are you? Welcome to the Pre-Construction Podcast. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Good, man. We're having a good old laugh there pre-recording uh, about uh, a certain few topics, but we'll, we'll get straight into it. Just before we do, um, anybody that doesn't know you that has been not on LinkedIn for the last five years, which is why you've been all over it, which is great to see, um, give us an idea of your background, what you do at the moment, and then we'll, uh, we'll trace your career all the way back to, to college. Yeah, uh, right now my official title is uh, VDC Design Office Lead, which is essentially a, a BIM manager role within the St. Louis office of uh, Jacobs Engineering. Uh, Jacobs, for those that aren't familiar with it, is the world's largest combined architecture and engineering company. Uh, we have offices everywhere from Australia to the United States to several places in Europe um, and I get to talk to a lot of people in similar roles to me in those other offices as well uh, so it's it unlike a lot of people that are in roles similar to mine where we tend to be isolated I have happen to be a little bit less isolated than a lot of us <laughs> so I, I have people that I can reach out to and gripe on occasion if I need to in order to uh, uh, get that support so very good do you, do you get a chance to, to visit Australia or Australasia I have not had a chance to do that yet. Uh, what's interesting about Jacobs, though, is that they do actually have things like exchange programs. Wow. We actually do have a architect currently from our St. Louis office that is in, I think it's the, uh, I can't remember if it's Melbourne or Sydney, but it, it, it's in one of the Australia offices. Very and, nice. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'd imagine she'll be coming back sometime in the next few months, but Yeah. <laughs> Or, or she may not. She may have. She may have fallen in love with an Australian guy and not coming back at all. That's always a possibility. <laughs> no, I, I had the, I had the, the fortunate uh, opportunity to work in Australia in Perth, Australia for two, two and a half years. So I can imagine she is having a ball. The Australian people are fun people. They're nice people. Uh, it, it would have to be a lot of fun. I, I'm just in one of those life situations now where I have uh, three kids, so it's just not practical at the moment. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it, would, it would be fun if the opportunity ever came around. <laughs> I'm the same. My, uh, my travel days are over. I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Uh, isolation's fun, and I think that's the only fun that I have at the moment. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Good. Well, listen, Brian, let's, let's go back to 1998 um, architecture. Were you always destined for construction? How did you come about? Because I know when I was going through uh, high school, it, 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 I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, was construction always at the forefront of your mind? Well, it, it, it's kind of interesting because... Um, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, which is what most people do, is that they see 1998. But what they don't really realize is that I actually graduated from high school all the way back in 1990. And the, uh, the, the reason why I bring that up is that I was taking drafting in high school. And I just fell in love with the process of drawing and drawing objects the way that they would actually look, actually be built in real life. So my first job, literally right out of high school, in fact, I was actually hired uh, before I actually even graduated from high school in a manufacturing plant. Now, the reason why that's relevant is that I learned after drawing fittings of this size, this size, this size, this size, this size, this size. And if this is starting to get boring to you, you start to realize how you feel after drawing those for four months like that in, inside of uh, AutoCAD um, that the manufacturing side of things and drawing parts just wasn't going to be one of those things that had a great interest to me. So I ended up uh, leaving there and going to uh, architecture school. Right. And uh, as I was going through architecture school, that's how I, uh, I ended up um, getting two different jobs in various architecture and engineering firms. So I was doing that part-time while I was going full-time to school. And, uh, between those things, that's how I started to realize that I really enjoyed the architecture side of things. That's not even touching on the quote unquote construction side of things. It's just the architecture part yeah. of it. Yeah. And then by 1998, I um, 
I was hired directly out of college, and a lot of that was because I had graduated high school in 1990 with a drafting job. So off and on, I'd been a draftsman for eight years. And how many people can actually say that when they've graduated <laughs> from school? They've got eight years of experience under their belts. Exactly. And was that a big was that a big plus for the company hiring you? Going, not only did this guy just finish architecture, but he's got drafting as well. It, it really was, and. Back then, um, by 1998, most people knew how to do AutoCAD, but back in 1990, most people, I mean, that's just when most people were just starting to adopt it. Mm -hmm. So by the time that I had came around in 1998, I already had experience in doing things like setting up office networks in um, doing some really strange stuff inside of AutoCAD, or at least what was strange for back then. And, uh, and I was able to just show all my previous work and they realized that I was just better at using AutoCAD than just about anybody else that they had at the time. <laughs> so it, it just made sense to go ahead and try to hire me and try to develop me as an employee from there. Very good. And with that as well, if, if someone, and I find it as well within pre-construction and estimating, if you're extremely good at one thing, then it's very difficult to kind of what what would we say learn other facets of the, the industry where people just constantly trying to put you into cadding autocad all the time and you were like i want to learn i want to learn what he's doing or i want to learn this that and the other they, they, they absolutely were for a while then what ended up happening is is that 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 first job out of college was actually working for a uh, a firm that would build houses and uh, so I was doing a lot of residential design work. And it also uh, was a bit of a gift to me because it meant that I could uh, leave the office environment and go out to the construction site and actually see the buildings going up that I had been drawing. Mm -hmm. So that helped me in understanding a little bit about the construction process and what they actually needed out in the field in order to be able to build something. So it helped develop my skills and in that regard, but it was nearly, um, oh, I guess it was close to eight years before yeah. I actually got out of the whole residential design field and uh, got into the more uh, CAD technical aspects of, of, of things because I eventually went to work for an Autodesk reseller. And right. it, it, it seems a little bit strange for me to say that uh, seven and a half, eight years out of college that I was burnt out on drafting, particularly since that was what my first love was. But the truth of the matter is, is that I had started drafting back my sophomore year in high school. So I had been drafting at that point professionally for 16 years. I had been um, maybe a little bit longer. Um, 18 years really and uh, and then even further back so I had nearly 20 years of drafting experience by the time I um, sort of got out of that aspect of the field um, as far as employers were concerned yeah they, they absolutely wanted me to learn uh, how it is that they ended up doing stuff very specifically and I was able to pick up on those different things that they wanted me to learn uh, but I was finding that just so many years of doing nothing but drawing and then also having a growing family as well that uh, for the experience that I had I just wasn't getting paid enough in order to be able to also raise a growing family which is the thing that ultimately changed me from going from residential design into the technology side of things if right. that answers your question yeah absolutely and then the technology side did you know it, that it always exists especially i would imagine it was more prominent in the commercial space um did you know it, it, it existed at that level with the vdc and the bim coming on board um the revit autocad whatever it was was it a case of you saw it happening and you go you know what i'm going to leave the residential space i see myself more aligned with this and, and, and that's actually a, a perfect lead into it as well, because one of the reasons why I was getting burnt out is that um, I had went from companies where I'd always stand it out as being the guy who knew more about AutoCAD or whatever the technology was than anybody else. And I ended up going from one firm that really valued it to another firm that 
I stepped back to releases in the software. And then I went to another firm that's, that basically maintained it, but they didn't have all the add-ins and that sort of thing. So I could just then see Revit and uh, other softwares that were you know, coming up. AutoCAD architecture was big at the time. Um, Land desktop was big at the time. And uh, I could see that my skills were just falling farther and farther behind. And it was just sort of eating away at my soul that I couldn't <laughs> be doing the stuff that I wanted to do. So that, that ended up being a, a big part of the burnout. It, you know, the, the same stuff that had energized me 15 years before, I was still doing it instead of the stuff that was continuing to energize me, which was continuously learning the new technologies and the uh, best ways to implement them. Very good. And, and anybody that hasn't saw your live videos should definitely tune into them. Um, whether you're a BIM BDC expert coordinator, um, someone learning the, 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 the software or, or new to the industry, you should definitely tune in. Brian goes through everything. It's one of the reasons that I started the pre-construction podcast. I believe, and, and I think you're the same, is the more that we share, the more that we can move forward as an industry and it can be brought on whether it be in the architecture firm, the, 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 the engineering firm, or actually the general contractor firm. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, for, the, for those that don't know my background, the, uh, w one of the ways that I was able to get into the technology side of things was that I actually started an Autodesk user group in town in order to be able to share my experiences. Yeah, and, yeah. It was, and, and our very first presenter was from the Autodesk reseller that eventually ended up hiring me. And that's one of the ways that we ended up meeting was through that. Very so, good. Great networking tip. The, the bigger your network, the more opportunities you will, you will give yourself, um, whether that be to, to working with someone side to side or for whatever reason you move on in your career. It, it absolutely is. And right now I happen to be a member of a, of a different user group in town, which happens to be a Revit user group, but we talk about all sorts of different technologies. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's important to know about that is that we also have a tendency to talk about um, the different employees that we have on staff, who's doing what, uh, what the latest advancement that company A is doing versus what company B is doing, sharing that information constantly amongst ourselves. And we don't care that we're sharing this information amongst ourselves within reason. I mean, we're, we're not going to give anybody a block of code that our company has paid for. <laughs> we'll force that person to actually develop it themselves. But, but there's this uh, competitive spirit in between us that we have absolutely no problem in sharing information because we're going to beat the other person when it comes down to actually doing it. Exactly. And, Action, and we talked about it before we started recording. It's all about action, and that, that really is what differentiates companies and differentiates <laughs> individuals and employees. I'm sure you've built really good VDC BIM estimating teams. It, it, it really differentiates each employee, how they, everybody can talk about doing it and generally knows how to do it, but it's actually actioning it. And that kind of brings me to another thing, because you, you, you did a very, very good live LinkedIn Live talk this morning on career development. Mm -hmm. You've now mentored, uh, been a part of big VDC teams. Um, what is it separates VDC coordinators or people coming on to the, the VDC spectrum? What do you think it is that they have that allows them to grow quicker within the, the industry? I, I think that the thing that on the VDC side of things, it's a constant striving for knowledge. Um, more than anything else, um, if you're one of those people that always wants to learn more, that always wants to be involved in every aspect of the construction process, then you're going to get a lot farther than somebody who wants to just be a uh, niche player who only you know, spe you know, cares about one little aspect of it. And once you start to have that mindset of, I want to learn more, then what you'll find is that you continue to develop your skills and it's not work at that point. It's, you know, I'm really interested in learning how to do 
an estimate based off of a model, for example. So you will focus all of your efforts on doing that as, at least as much as possible, and you'll continue to develop your skills up, develop your skills up, develop your skills up. Two years down the road, what you just consider every day, hey, I'm going to the office kind of work, suddenly sets you apart because you understand it better than 95% of the people around you. And why did you do that immediately? Well, it's not because you were necessarily assigned the task as much as it was just an interest that you had and you just continued to explore deeper and deeper and deeper. And the most important thing to realize in that is that um, when, when, when it comes to that process is that you can't be afraid to fail. Yeah. Failure is a learning opportunity. And watching people around you fail, not because you encourage them to fail, obviously, but when other people fail, you stepping in and helping them succeed also helps grow you and your understanding of it. And um, well, the, the, to, make, to make a long story short, I guess, um, the thing that probably makes any of us in this field successful is just this continual thirst for self-improvement and, and watching things grow and eventually you get to watch other people take the stuff that you've helped develop and just do some of the most amazing things that you've ever seen with it and it just almost takes your breath away and you're thinking i can't believe that i was just a tiny little part of that process yeah Brilliant. And, and, and I like on your LinkedIn as well, you have, you specifically say on your, your LinkedIn mentor, um, because we've all done it. We've all had it in our careers. We talked about it before we came on, on air. You've got to pivot at certain stages of your career where you think, and it might not always be the right way, uh, but you, you eventually find your way. But to have a mentor to be able to guide you or just literally nudge you in, in the right direction, it's so important. It's something that did you have that during your career or, or was that a kind of a path that you navigated yourself? What, what's funny is, is that I think that a lot of the people that were my mentors at the time, I didn't know they were my mentors. Oh, right. You know, they, they happened to either be a coworker or else they happened to be a boss. And there were people that guided me along the way, uh, sometimes to uh, my own personal frustrations because I was thinking, I wouldn't do it that way. And then they'll look <laughs> at, it, at it years later and realize that they were right about it. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I could spend the next 10 minutes doing nothing but just talking about the different mentors that I've had in this industry. And in some cases, they, they could use technology, they could use VDC. Other times, they couldn't do it at all. But that didn't mean that they weren't just as much of a mentor. And I just want to thank them if they're watching right now right. Um, for you know, everything they've done for me in my career. Yeah, I, I agree because it, it's so important, as you say, whether you're, you're, you're a mentor or you're, you're assigned to a mentor as a young employee or you just watch and learn from your, your older peers or people more senior for you. Brilliant. And just give me quickly now, obviously with Jacobs, because it seems like you've, you've been with Jacobs for quite a while. Give us an understanding of the whole market, the relationships between the architecture, the, the, the engineering side and the construction side, the GC side. Um, throughout your career, what, who, is, who is ahead when it comes to BIM VDC? Who's lagging behind? And how do you see it all playing out? Who, who's going to have the, 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 the end control? It, it, it really kind of depends on... Um, I'm debating on the best way they actually answer that question because um, as far as at the very beginning, I would almost say that the architects were ahead of a lot of the other people. And to this day, as far as the wide span of technology goes, I would still say that the architects are probably ahead. On the other hand, if we're really talking about VDC and designing of components, fabrication, then the construction side over the last few years has just rocketed up. Um, I did for uh, a few years also work for a really large general contractor. And it was, it was fascinating to watch how they were using the technology as opposed to how things were being done on what I'll describe as the design side, even though both sides do design. Um, because um, we were doing so much more um, 
clash detection. We were doing so much more with uh, individual parts and cost estimating and actually caring about the data embedded into the content on the contractor side than what we were on the architecture side. Mm -hmm. Now that's starting to catch up on the architecture side of things because, well, they want to be more involved in estimating the construction process, that sort of thing. And I don't want to leave the engineers out of this either because um, people like the structural engineers, you could actually make an argument that they were the first BIM people because they were designing things inside of software that was three dimensional. Yeah. even if it just looked like sticks. And um, there was indicating the forces coming down, what size the members needed to be. So they've probably been doing it longer than the vast majority of us, even though they're not always viewed as being far ahead of everybody else. It's just that their stuff isn't as glamorous as everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so I have great respect for what's going on in the structural side of things. Good. And uh, right now I'm probably seeing the most advancement actually on the uh, mechanical systems, electrical sides of things where um, not that they haven't been using it for a long time, but they've now went from a point of, do I really have to do this on a project to understanding what their importance is for doing it right on a project. Yeah. And so, so they're all coming together in order to be able to, you know, put that project out at a higher quality. Yeah. And specifically my kind of network, we, we, I concentrate a lot on the GC side, pre-construction and estimating. So a lot of the, the, the audience here will be junior, mid-level, senior estimators within a general contractor. Um, we're, if, if you were talking to them now, what would you give them? What piece of advice would you give them on how it's, how it's going to move, how they can develop their career, how they can improve things? Well, the, the thing on the estimating side of things is that um, there, there, there are two different aspects. And I will get directly to your question here in just a moment. The, uh, the first aspect is what you end up doing during the actual early phases of design and then you have what gets done actually I'll, I'll say uh, out in the general contractor side of things and the early phases of design they do care about estimating but it tends to be very high level mm -hmm. estimating as opposed to the kind of estimating that you do um, out in the field so when, when, when I got a, uh, a role for the general contractor side of things, what ended up occurring was I started looking back at all the engineering stuff that I had been involved with and thinking, why would I use any of this data? Because I can't use any of it for my estimates. Yeah. Uh, they're just not modeling it properly so that I can make any use of this data at all. <laughs> Frustrated. Well, yeah, it, it really was. And I was finding that my own team, my, my subcontractors were the ones that were actually putting out the really high quality models that could then be used for, you know, doing the estimates, whatever the case may be. But as time went on, I started to realize that, you know, BIM really isn't a push button solution where you push a button and it just gives you the answers to everything. Uh, what you can do is that you can take that design information and there is information in there that you can leverage. You know what the total square footage of a space is. Uh, since you know what the total square footage of a space is and you know generally how the inside of that space is constructed, that means that you can assign a dollar value to the size of that space and be able to, at least on your initial estimates, be able to uh, derive roughly how much the space is going to actually cost. Mm -hmm. uh, you can start doing quantity takeoffs of certain kinds of items. Mm -hmm. So don't just sort of ignore what's coming from the design side and don't just take everything that comes from the design offices for gospel. What you need to do is find that uh, perfect mix of what it is you can take from, let's say, the, uh, the design side right now, assuming that we're not talking about a situation where you know, they're truly working together in harmony and uh, find what information you can take from there and find what information you can take from your subcontractors or even before that and really apply that uh, art and science of estimating based off of all the different information that you get in mm -hmm. and try not to be too frustrated by the fact that uh, the people on 
one side of this industry don't understand what you're going through and the people on the other side of the industry don't understand what you're going through. Instead, actually have conversations with the people on both sides yeah. so that you get the information that you need so that you can do your job as efficiently as possible. And uh, because getting frustrated doesn't help anything, instead, or saying this company doesn't give us what we want, that doesn't help anything if you haven't had the conversation with them to say, you know, we really need this. Can you help us with this? Yeah. And, and the chances are that they probably have that information and they can, they, they just, they didn't know that they had to share it or they didn't want to share it or they forgot yeah. to share it. Um, yeah, I agree with you because you've, you've got the, the perfect background and you've, you've been and seen all, you've been the architecture, the designer, the engineering side, the GC side. Um, so, would you advise someone coming up to try uh, if, if they got the opportunity to try each side of the fence? I would advise somebody to go after the things that they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's both sides of the fence, absolutely could be. In my case, it worked out wonderfully going on both sides of the fence. Uh, but But on the other hand, I know that some people that just don't have the personality to be able to sit in an office 24 seven and never get to see whatever it is that they've designed get built. Yeah. On the, on the other hand, I know people that uh, really have no interest in going out and maybe I shouldn't say no interest, but much reduced interest in going out and seeing what's getting built. And instead they're happy to be able to sit in their air conditioned cubicle on the phone half the day or filling in paperwork or whatever the case may be. And if that's your passion, go for it. Yeah. So there really isn't a correct answer. It really depends on you and your experiences and what it is that drives you as far as, you know, what the best answer to that question is. Yeah. Though, though I will say that the more that you understand about what the other person does, uh, the more that you're going to be able to have those conversations and get the information from them that you need to and also convince them to give you the information that you need so that you can do your job more effectively. Yeah, so really, you talked about it today in your, in your live video, having the soft skills or, or maturing your soft skills throughout your career is vital to, to BIM BDC. It, 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 it's amazingly vital. And one of the things that you always need to know is that the individual that's in front of you is even if they're in the same role as the person that sits right next to them, their motivations aren't always the same, meaning that you could have a 60 year old um, estimator that knows that in five years from now, he's getting ready to retire. Then you may have a 32 year old estimator who knows that for the next 30 years, he's gonna be in this profession, at least ideally. And their motivations are probably a little bit different it's not just because of age, but it's, but it, but in part, it's because uh, one person has been doing the same processes for 20, 30 years. What message did you deliver to that person that's been doing the same process for 20, 30 years that would make them buy into a slight change that would refine the process, which will give them greater confidence in their estimate and make them, you know, have, you know, still content in doing their job. That message that you deliver is going to be much different to that person who's only been doing it for a few years, who's aspiring to be that guy that's been around for 30 years. Um, so in one aspect, you may start to talk more about the technology and automation and um, how you're able to automatically generate these things. And then they start to get excited about it because they've grown up around the technology and automation. So you start to, with that individual, you start to build them up. They make them into your uh, champions, your super users, the people that are going to spread the good word. But you also need to be able to deliver the message to the individuals that only have a few years left. Or maybe they've been working in the same company for seven years and now they're tied to their ways and they just don't want to improve at all. And how do you convince that individual to, uh, to make that change? Yeah. 
it, it becomes those soft skills because what you need to do is you need to ask those open-ended questions to find out what it is that actually motivates them, why it is that they're resistant. And you have to ask those questions in such a way that it doesn't aggravate them so that they'll never answer your questions again. And, uh, and then deliver the, the deliver the message so that both of these individuals are both going to the same outcomes. Yeah, very good. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and just you touched on it briefly there about the technologies. What are the, the, the most innovative technologies that you see currently? Um, what, what gets you up in the morning? What gets you excited about the way the market's going? Um, because there are a few at the moment that are, that are kind of trying to disrupt or revolutionize the, the, the BIM BDC, the technology side of things. What do you see as the most exciting ones? It, it, it's, it's a great question. And uh, right now, I, I would have a hard time pinpointing and saying that I think that this is the best thing, period, and meaning like a very specific technology. Yeah. Uh, on the other th side of the fence, though, I, I think that uh, one of the things that's coming up that's going to just revolutionize the way that we do things is going to be... Um, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the way that it's going to help us with our decision making on the estimating side of things what it's going to be able to do is that right now we had to tend to be in a state where we're inputting data in the software programs for our estimates mm -hmm. and uh, it could be for a specific type of building it could be for a specific part of the country whatever the case may be well we can start to track we were doing these purchases at this time of the year. This is what the weather conditions were at this time of the year. Um, these were the, you know, it was this type of structure. It was very similar to what this, this other client was doing, or maybe we're doing five facilities for the same client. And each one of these facilities is very similar. Well, what the artificial intelligence is going to eventually be able to do is begin to actually parse through that data then you'll be able to have things like Microsoft BI and the business intelligence graphs to actually show you nice, pretty pictures of all that information. And you'll be able to make uh, better educated guesses based off of um, the information that you're seeing on the screen, based off of um, you know, all this information that you've been putting into your software programs for the last few years. And then with that data in front of you, you're, you'll then no longer be making, you know, taking days, sorting through data, spreadsheets, trying to figure out, okay, what do I need to worry about? What did I do on this project seven years ago? You'll be able to just push a few buttons, see some graphs, and have a better understanding of, A, what you did seven years ago, and B, how that is impacted now by the increased cost, uh, the different conditions that are available now. And the artificial intelligence is going to be the thing that ends up helping sort that data so that you can make better use of it. Yeah. And will that, will that data, with artificial intelligence, will they be running off the models to, to be able to do that? Or, or, or will the data be pu pushed back into the models? Well, the, one of the things that a lot of people get uh, mistaken about is that it's is that BIM is about models. And BIM isn't about models. BIM is almost always about information. Mm -hmm. And the information could be the way something looks, which is the reason why you can do pretty renderings, but, inf but, but information could just be something that you've put into a database. Yeah. Uh, an example of that is right now within our own office, we are implementing uh, Dorofus. And Dorofus is software that allows our interior designers to be able to generate their uh, room data sheets off of. Yeah. So they're literally just inputting information into a database and then that database information can then get pushed into Revit, the design software, and populate, let's say, the center of that room with all the furniture, all the equipment that needs to be there. Then all they have to do is just move it to the right spots yeah. and they're done. Or vice versa, they can do the design and then they can push it into the Dorofus software and then there it is inside of the database one group of individuals decided to do it visually by placing it inside of a model. Another person decided, you know, I don't like working inside of a model. I'm just going to input it inside of a database. Yeah. But they're both sharing the same information. 
Right, very good. Yeah. So, so, so it all comes together, it, and it, it comes together in a way that works best for their workflows. Yeah, of course. And you'll see that, obviously, architecture, engineering, and the, the GC side of it. Right, because then that information can then be transferred over to the GC side of things because now we have an entire spreadsheet filled with the information that they need in order to be able to do um, takeoffs of the interiors because more than likely, you know, anything from furniture to the, the door count to the equipment that's in there, that information is probably right, but maybe it needs to be tweaked a little bit. Yeah. But, but, that's fine because they now have it in this gigantic database. They know that it matches up with the stuff that happened on the design side of things. So now they can take that information, tweak it with exact manufacturer information, that sort of stuff, and continuously add to that database in order to uh, derive the information that they need out of it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that also applies to the construction side of things as well, where um, that same information could then be used for um, going out with a, what's called a robot and be able to go out there and actually tell the exact placement of where this stuff should actually be at. Yeah. And it all ties together. Yeah. Funny, we had a uh, Noni Pittinger on from California talking about that, about going from digital through robotics. Um, I think she worked with, within the aerospace, um, manufacturing within the aerospace, and they did a, a job in Atlanta, and that's exactly what happened. It was the robot designed and did everything and put it in the exact place. So it was all scanning and, 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 and visual. It was incredible, her talking about it and seeing the project come, come to fruition. Do you guys use any of, of robotics as yet? Um. On our construction side of things, the answer is yes, they are using that. Um, that's not really my direct specialty to be able to talk about, unfortunately, no but, the, the, but, the, but they are absolutely using that kind of thing, yeah. yeah. And, and, and they are taking the data from the design side in order to be able to uh, uh, you know, leverage some of that technology. Yeah. On, a, on, on a side note, uh, definitely related to this, um, at uh, Autodesk University this year, which is, for those of you that don't know, it's a big industry conference of, uh, it tends to be Autodesk software, but it's people from all over the industry. And uh, they, they had um, this little robot called Spot that was walking around the entire conference. It looked like a little dog. <laughs> and, and, they, and they had a, 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 an actual scanner mounted to its back. So it was walking around the crowd scanning the entire conference area and then stopping sometimes kneeling down acting like a puppy getting back up again but the point of it was is if you started to watch videos on it you could see it could go up and down stairs it could just walk between people which means that if you had a construction environment it could walk you know around the equipment around the people that were there it would know to stop if people got in its way and right. continue to do a scan as it was going through so is, is that is that the ideal toy for you? You're sitting in the office, you're, you're, you're sending your dog out to have a look to make sure everything's in place, um, bringing you back real-time visuals? Well, you, what, what's interesting about that is, th let's think about it in a non-office environment situation where let's say that we're scanning a mine or some sort of shaft. Yeah. Um, it's areas that may not be safe for human beings to go into. It could be a building that had a fire and you're not a hundred percent sure if you can go in there in order to get the information. You could actually send that bot in there in order to scan the area, take photos, bring that data back out again, and then you can use it for your, you know, design and construction applications downstream. Brilliant. Love it. Love it. And Autodesk is good. Would you recommend that particular conference? Um, or is there any other conferences that you would recommend people attend? Well, I, I would definitely uh, recommend uh, Autodesk University, if for nothing else, than the fact that it's the uh, probably the leading software company out there for the, these kinds of softwares, yeah. um, and that's across industries. Yeah. And um, I forget what the other conference is now called because they just changed their name. It used to be uh, Built, and um, that was also a very good conference to attend. Good, good. So, 
Yeah. Highly recommend it. Good. And then oh, one question I always like asking people, what is the most fascinating, interesting, beautiful projects that you ever worked on? Uh, or even, even uh, it can be a small complex one that you were, you, you were, it was really rewarding. Um, is there any that stand out throughout your career? Yeah, I'm going to say that there's three and the very first one is going to be a complete shock and uh, that happened to be a maximum security prison because you have absolutely no idea what goes into a maximum security prison until you happen to be on a project team that has to design one of those things. <laughs> yeah, I won't go into all the details here, but trust me, there's a lot inside of a maximum security prison. Very good. Uh, the, uh, the, the other two things that are probably closer to my heart is that um, the last project I did at my previous job, uh, the general contractor, uh, we did a hospital project, a very large hospital project. And it was wonderful to see the process of design from um, literally nothing being on the site to watching the steel go up and, and that sort of thing. Uh, part of my process was actually figuring out where the uh, crane placement, because we had two large cranes yeah. and putting that inside of the software and showing how the, the, the radiuses of the cranes actually were and whether or not they could reach certain spots inside of there. But, but to know that this is a hospital and to have had the opportunity to do some of the initial uh, clash detections, that sort of things inside of the hospital and coordinate the various trades. It's, it was just a beautiful project. And then the final thing is um, right out of school, I was designing homes and I did have the opportunity on that first job to go out to the site after several of the homes had already been done and people had started to move in. Yeah. And to watch the reaction of somebody who was now living in one of those homes to actually meet the designer of that house, <laughs> that was just an absolutely priceless reaction. And to this day, I have no idea what her name was. I can still see her face and the reaction that she had when she realized she was looking at the designer of the place that she'd been living in for the last few months. It was brilliant. And, and I, I, would I would imagine that conversation is fantastic as well because she's trying, she would pick your brain on why did you do that? I really like that, whether it's practical or visual, I really like what you did there. And, and that's exactly right. And people always have a tendency to overlook the little things. Residential is a, is a great example of that because people always tend to forget when they draw out their own floor plans that uh, they need some place to put their towels. So they half the time forget that there should be a linen closet somewhere. Now, the thing that, that she was excited about was things like the living area and all the materials that had been picked out for the living area and that sort of thing. And I completely appreciated that. But in the very back of my mind, I'm thinking, I bet you really like that linen closet that was put <laughs> <in> there. <laughs> it's just those little design considerations that people don't always think about, but uh, it just adds to the, the whole experience. Yeah. And do you get that? Do you still get that? Because I think it's pretty obvious from this chat and your background, you're very creative. Um, do you still get that, that, that ability to be creative when you're in an engineering firm, a GC, an architecture firm? There's always opportunities to be creative. The, uh, I, I think too often people have a tendency to uh, allow themselves to get stagnant yeah. and just do the same things over and over. But if you take the time to actually look at processes and look at ways that things could be improved and then actually try to use new techniques even if they fail, just try to do different things. Um, it, it ends up giving, it's, it's a very rewarding thing. It's much like if you decided to take on a project at your house and you were building crafts and you have this nice little craft, whatever it is you've, you've built and you take pride in it and you, you display it. Yeah, that basket of flowers means nothing to anybody but you, but you take great pride in it. For me, I, I look at the way that I'm adapting technology or changing the way that somebody is now looking at a software program and going from, I'm very resistant of it to, you know what, I can't live without it. Even though I get very little credit for it other than the initial, yeah, he's the one that helped with it. To see that person using it 
it's just a rush every single time because you realize that you've just made their career, their lives just a little bit better. Just like working with that, you know, just like the lady in the house, you know that you've done little things that have made their lives just a little bit better, even if they didn't always realize it or give you full credit for it. So it can be very rewarding. Yeah, yeah, satisfying. And and if, if you were to go back uh, or even give your your 25, 26-year-old self some advice, um, what would it be? Uh, study the business more. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, my 20-something-year-old self was very um, much into the technology, was very much into um, creating things. And uh, even though I knew that the business was important, and in the back of my mind, I knew that economics was important, that sort of thing, I always had kind of a hard time understanding how it all tied together. Uh, what one of my favorite things that's happened recently is that somebody came up to me and said, you know, I keep trying to get this adopted inside of my firm, but every time I do that, their eyes just glaze over every time I talk about this technology. And I said, tell me, how did you go about doing it? And the answer is, well, I showed them and showed them just how neat this actually is. I go, did you use the word this technology is neat. It's something like that. No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't do that. No, 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 no. Uh, you need to come at it with the the argument of okay, this is why in your career for the business, why it is that it makes sense, how it helps the client, how it is that it helps you. These are all things that my myself 20, 25 years ago. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew it was important, but I had absolutely no idea how this tied into the big picture at all. I would love to sit that person down for nothing but three days and give them just a knowledge dump of everything that I know today about that, uh, because it would have made a complete difference in my career and the way that things ended up going. Yeah. Because, I mean, we, we work with general contractors mainly and within pre-construction and VDC BIM coordinators, BIM managers. And that is one of the biggest things that people have a, a, an issue with is whether you like it or not, it's internal selling. So selling the features, the benefits of this, and then obviously training project managers, superintendents on it yeah. once, once it's been passed through. Because it is quite difficult to go to your boss or go to a VP or a, a leadership team and say, we need this, we need you to spend X amount to be able to, 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 to market, to class detect, whatever it may be. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, to kind of go back to a question that you had asked earlier, and I'm giving it a little bit more thought now, um, I th actually think that probably the best kind of person to do the role that I'm in is actually probably a project manager type. The only issue is, is that more than likely their first love is the actual construction of things. So being out there is such a major part that maybe they don't necessarily want to move into an environment where they're not getting to be out there quite as often. Yeah. That being said, though, managing people managing the way that a project goes together, looking for ways in order to save money, looking for efficiency gains, understanding the way that a building goes together, that's my job. Yeah. I actually almost consider myself more of a project manager than I do a VDC, BIM, whatever title you wanna give me kind of guy. And um, I actually think that anybody who's trained on the project management side of things other than the fact that they have to have a natural curiosity, love, that sort of thing. I think that those, both, both, actually there's a lot of soft skills in there, but both soft and hard skills that you learn from the project manager side of things is actually in many ways, the perfect way to transition into this career. Because I mean, learning how to solve a technology problem, I can do that in hours. 
Yeah. I'm an expert at Google searches. <laughs> But uh, in order to do all the other things, that can take just years to develop those yeah, skills. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly and, right. And listen, we get clients all the time saying, listen, do not bring me an estimator or a VDC coordinator that has not worked on site as a field engineer, project engineer, APM, superintendent. Once they, as you say, they know, and, and listen, because other companies are incredible. They bring them in there as junior estimators. They sit them in the junior estimator for a year, a year and a half. They get them on a, a decent sized big project. They get them to estimate it, and then they put them on site to deliver it. So that gives you the cradle to grave experience of what it takes to build a $40, $50 million project. And that's, that's vital. It absolutely is. And I was lucky enough to be at the GC to actually watch people that came in around the same time I did get developed using that exact same way that you were just describing. And it's amazing to watch the transformation from when they come in green to they're actually controlling aspects of their project. It's just it's wonderful to see them grow the way that they do. Yeah, and as you say, the satisfaction's there as well. I mean, I'm sure there's loads of projects that you've, you've kind of drove past or walked past or saw a picture of and go, listen, I had a huge part to play in that project. Um, to be able to say that you estimated it and project managed delivered it, I mean, there's, there's no better feeling, I'm sure. Oh, no, there, there absolutely isn't. And I, I've always said that uh, if you get the opportunity to show it to your kids or one of these days your grandkids and say, hey, I was a part of this project, hopefully that's something that they actually remember about you, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, because, uh, you know, that, that was a little bit of you in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's still, and it's still standing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it's still standing. Yeah. For some reason, they decided not to tear that down. That's right. <laughs> Very good. So I, I like, uh, again, career development's an important thing. And I think important thing for anybody, whether you're operations side, pre-construction side, technology side, you mentioned, is there any uh, like courses that you would recommend? Obviously courses specific to VDC, but books that you think they should read, podcasts they should listen to, how should they upskill them, themselves? Because even right now during COVID-19, it's a perfect opportunity to take on a course for how many hours a week uh, and really come back a better, stronger pre-construction operations VDC person. What, what, what's interesting about that is that I, I don't really have a, I feel much about this much like I do about computers. With a computer nowadays, I really don't have too many, um, people ask me, what computer should I buy? Well, I usually end up saying, well, how much can you afford? Mm -hmm. And um, because all the computers today, they pretty much have the same parts in them from the same companies. It's just different manufacturers that have put them together. It's just a matter of finding the right system for you. Yeah. Then I actually look at education the same way, is that right now there are so many sources, uh, whether it be something like uh, LinkedIn Learning, which I'm involved with, or just getting on YouTube or uh, picking up a book, whatever the case may be. It's what you get out of it that ends up being important. And, and now so much of this stuff is so inexpensive mm -hmm. that, that you can just do a quick search and you can find dozens and dozens and dozens of different things. You can usually skim through it, fast forward through videos, whatever the case may be, and, and get a background on what it is that you care about. But the important thing here isn't the fact that you have all this information available to you, it's that you need to give a little bit of thought on what's important to actually learn. Yeah. Because I, I, I find too often people will end up uh, um, watching videos on uh, how to use Windows or how to use Microsoft Excel or uh, how to make the best PowerPoint presentation. And, and while there's value to that, unless you're doing that on a regular basis, that's probably not going to advance you in your career. Uh, you're, uh, if you happen to be a, um, a uh, structural engineer, do you really need to uh, watch a Revit video on how to do uh, uh, furniture inside of Revit? Probably not. You might find it interesting. You might learn something, but it's probably not going to help you with your career. So the, the, the most important thing is, is because there are so many resources out there, it's pinpoint what it is that you want to 
accomplish. Yeah. Then do a quick search and figure out, okay, these are my options to learn. And then just start to skim through it. Mm -hmm. And I find that some of the, the best learning that I do is just quickly skimming through articles or uh, just going online and reading a, like, go to the preview of a book on Amazon, just read the first couple of pages. If it's interesting, I'm all in, I buy it. <laughs> if it's not interesting, I go, nope, this has nothing to do with me. I've wasted my money. I'm, or I'm haven't wasted my money and I go on to the next thing. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of the long answer of saying that uh, the most important thing isn't necessarily me giving you a specific website or a specific yeah. book or it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, what is it that resonates with you and what you find important? And you need to be able to define that. And once you do, finding thousands of pages of information on that topic is yeah. just incredibly easy to do. Yeah, there's so much out there, uh, so much good stuff. Um, and it's, as you say, it's, it's, it's free. Most of it's free. Um, very, very few things now you actually have to pay for. Yeah, and that's actually one of the reasons why, and I'm not just saying that because I do videos for LinkedIn Learning, uh, it's because LinkedIn Learning has so much content that you can just go to the first video or two and go, you know what, I'm not interested in that. And then you go on to the next video or two and go, I'm not interested in that. And that, that applies to no matter what it is that you're interested in doing, you know, whether it's, uh, estimating structural design whatever the case may be you just find something that you know applies to you and then sit down and just go through all that information and i think that even when you're studying or even before you're studying it's a great way of actually understanding what you like to do because yeah. none of it was available when i was at school well there probably was but I, I, it was probably wasn't as easily accessible and it took until, so I did a four year degree, but one of the year was on site, or uh, three years, three years practical and one once on site working. I, mm -hmm. I realized it took me to the fourth year to realize that this just wasn't what I wanted to do. Yeah. So if you can do that before you get into a degree, then it's, it's all the better. Well, that, that's absolutely right. And the, I've actually found the two best ways to learn aren't the ways that I've actually mentioned. The first way is to actually do it. Yeah, yeah, just just trial, do it. Trial and error, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah exactly. And the, the, the other thing is, well, there's doing it on a project, mm -hmm. and then the, the, the other way to actually do it is trial and error. Just practice it, try it. If you can't make it work, then look up the answer to how you do it, and then make it work. Um, I happen to be old enough. I've already said that I graduated high school in 1990, so I can say that I'm 47. And uh, back then, the internet didn't exist. I couldn't just Google search something. <laughs> the real reason why I was the IT guy, the CAD guru, whatever, back in the day is because none of these resources existed. They didn't even have books on this stuff. <laughs> so I was the person who would take the, the information and I would break it and then I'd break it again and then I'd break it again about the seventh time I broke it I, I would eventually on that eighth time I would find the answer to it yeah and, and then people would start coming to me by the time they got the uh, the uh, the actual uh, I'll use the word guts the actual guts to actually try to do that and they broke it they'd come over and say I don't know what I've done and the answer was oh I can help you with that <laughs> and I was immediately the guru. No, I, I'm the, I, I, I'm the idiot that broke it seven times. But, but, but that's because as a society now, we're very, very good at skimming. You mentioned that like we skim yeah. things. We don't actually get into the nuts and bolts of it and learn it properly. Or as you say, break it and then try and fix it again. I mean, when was the last time we took a phone apart or we took a computer apart to understand what's in, inside it? Um, and the people that do that, as you say, whether it's down a rabbit hole, you, you just keep going until you get a yes or a no. And a definitive, a definitive no or a definitive yes. That, that, that's exactly right, yeah. So, so whenever I'm, I'm going to a website or whether or not I'm looking at videos, whatever the case may be, 
honestly, I'm looking at those for, well, maybe a, a idea to a very specific solution, but more importantly, what I'm really doing is, is I'm, I'm looking at what its capabilities are so that when it comes time for me to need something along these lines, I have seven different ways I can break it before I figure out what that eighth solution is in order to, you know, really make it sing. Because I'll, I'll tell you, and, and this is the probably the, the best piece of advice that I can give, is that virtually anybody who looks like that they are just a miracle worker inside of any kind of software program or doing any sort of process, They've had their boss yell at them at some point. They have had, uh, they have messed that up so so bad. They've done an estimate and they've totally screwed that estimate up. Somebody has stood over their shoulder and told them correct methods about how to actually go about doing it. And how did they learn? It's because they made the mistake. That's the best way to go about learning. You you can you can learn from videos, from books. You know, this is the general process that you should be following. I don't care how many times you do it, you're still going to make the mistakes. And it's the process of having to fix those mistakes that is the best learning experience that you can have. Yeah, yeah. It's more satisfying as well. It's it's no oh, it absolutely is. Nothing worse. So here's a question, Brian Myers. Brian Myers, the teacher the mentor, the LinkedIn learning guru, the BIM VDC, the full-time job, job the, 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 the family man. What, what do you do to get away from it all? What do you do to relax and switch off? <laughs> or do, do, you, do you even find time to do that and sleep at the same time? Or how does it work? What's it, the magic? You know, it, 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 it's a combination of different things. Um, right now, my... Uh, complete switch off is if I'm, I'll either go for a walk out in the woods or else I will uh, get in my convertible and drive around in my convertible and just let the wind blow. Uh, the, uh, on, on the other hand though, if, if you ask my family, you know, cause those are things that I'm usually doing outside on by my, by myself, uh, they'll see me in front of a computer and I'm either breaking things or else I'm learning things or else I'm recording the instructional videos or basically I have such a variety of different things, all industry related, but it's such a variety of industry things that I'm involved in that it seems like I'm always just plugged into the industry in one way or another, unless I'm outside just enjoying the weather. So. Very good. So talk to me about industry. So that the convertible, is that like aerodynamics or how does that, how does that industry? Really work? <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's the convertible of choice uh, at the moment, Brian? <laughs> well, uh, right right now I have a, a Fiat uh, 124 Spider, and nice. uh, it's uh, not the fastest vehicle on earth, but it's got a bit of acceleration and it's got some beautiful handling. So I just uh, drop the top and uh, just go wherever it is that I want to go. So uh, yeah, I, I can't tie that back to design at all. I just. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, listen, this has been wonderful. I have to say thank you very much because I think the, the VDC coordinators, the BIM coordinators on here will get so much value out of this uh, and also the estimating and pre-construction um, audience that we have. So uh, I want to say thank you for that. I, I do appreciate it. And, and probably the, the last thing that I want to mention is that I highly encourage that if you are on the construction side of things, to talk to the people on the design side of things. And if you're on the design side of things, talk to the people on the construction side of things, because you're all in this together. You're not combative or anything like that. And the more that you exchange knowledge, the more that you work together, the more you're going to realize that you're actually a lot more alike than what you think. And you can get better together. Absolutely. And I think, to be honest, with this COVID-19 isolating, I think people are getting better at communicating, believe it or not. Um, I don't know whether it's uh, the environment that they're in, but I definitely see people getting better at coming back to me and, 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 and organizing things. So let's hope that continues between the, the architecture, the design, the engineering and the construction side. It, it, I'll, I'll say this it's an awful lot easier to get people into meetings today <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much brian uh thank you i appreciate it